All right. Everyone, let's make sure everything's working. Technology. Still showing Tiffany's video and not me. Okay. All right. Did you have a nice, restful weekend? No. What? What do you mean, no? It wasn't because of me. Oh, well, I don't care about your other classes. I mean, in relation to this class. Yeah, you didn't have any assignments to work on this weekend. It was a gift to all of you. Thank you. You are welcome. Next time you'll have more, so thank you. Uh, but I wasn't fast enough, you see. But so clearly I need to learn about kissing up. OK. Uh, cool. Moving forward, so we will have to not keep you in this limbo where you're spending so much time on, quote, other classes. Um, we'll have a new module releasing today after class. Um, it's going to be putting together what we've learned before of uh, understanding HTTP and building a web server. So we're going to be uh, building a web server in um, x86, 64, yes, after class today, sometime. Mm. That's important. You're not asking when you can start working on it. I'm asking how much time I'm Ah, uh, it'll be due Tuesday, next Tuesday. So eight days, slightly more than eight. Uh, and then we can look at, this is a nice graph of the last module. So this is the grades, a daily grade of the last module at some type of midnight. We don't know what time zone midnight this is. Um, this line here is the 70% line. So you can see the none is people who haven't even started or solved one challenge, right? Or not even started a challenge, right? Yeah, so it's not even a zero is you at least started a challenge and couldn't solve that one. That's here. Uh, this none is didn't even start. Uh, so we can see this as we get closer. Boom, 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 boom. And what's this roughly? So somewhere between these is roughly the grades, right? On the last module. The last, three bars are accurate. the last three bars are accurate. Okay, this is all rough. What? What do you mean they didn't work past the deadline? These are these students are dedicated to their assignments. Uh, so yeah, pretty good. I think this is a good distribution. Uh, I was happy with that. 5% just don't bother. Yes, uh, that is correct. Uh, that is how it goes. Cool. Okay. So if this doesn't tell you, I don't know, if you're in the on the left side of this line now, A, there's the late policy, so you get 50% credit to try to move over the line. Uh, B, start early, right? So I think, I guess this doesn't show it, but I'm certain the people that started like here got to the far right by the time assignment was due. All right. Now let's talk about, so we actually already covered system calls, right? Right? Remembering what we did on Wednesday in class? We had class Wednesday. You watched the lectures for sure. What did we talk about? Stuff? Yeah. We oh, one slide in. Okay, uh, we. All right, let me double check that. I thought we went farther. Did we not? We got to here. Didn't we get to uh, like all this table? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We talked about a lot of system calls. Great. Cool. Okay, so we talked about all these system calls. Now we're gonna put it in action. So I'll go over. Demo the very first module because, or the demo the very first level because it's honestly very uh, easy, um, and the assignment literally tells you how to do it. Okay, what's the first thing I should do? Challenge run. Okay. Uh, in this series of challenges, you'll be writing assembly. Hey, we like assembly to interact with your environment. Hey, we're learning how to interact with the environment uh, and ultimately build a web server. Hey, we've using web clients. Now we get to build a web server. Uh, in this challenge, you will exit a program. Ooh, the most fascinating of programs. 
Okay, so to use this, we're gonna do slash challenge run and give it the path to a web server. Um, and actually, this is actually setting you up, but let's ignore this for now. I'll start with this as a, a placeholder. So let's start up with a server. I'm gonna call, uh, I'm gonna, uh, you probably will not have this on your machine. Okay, vim server.s. I hate lowercase s, but that's fine. We'll go with that. Okay, so I'm going to delete this stuff. So we know we're going to have to do a system call. Yeah. Um, this assignment is not deployed on the server yet. Correct. It will be deployed after class. So the point is for you to pay attention, not to start. <laughs> you can do it later. Um, cool. Okay. So we have some assembly code, and it's telling us how to assemble. What, how is this one different than what we were doing last time? So we're using AS to, what does AS do? It assembles our assembly file to what? Yeah, an ELF object file. And then LD, the loader, turns that object file into what? An executable that we can run. Cool, so now we should have something .server. And segmentation fault core dumped. Okay. Uh, let's run it with the challenge first and then we'll. Uh... Okay, cool. So it tells us again what our goal is and it's telling us what it expects in the format that we're going to talk about in a second of S trace. So S trace is going to be your friend. It traces the system calls that your process makes. This actually is incredibly handy even knowing that you can do this, um, there were definitely some cases where you're trying to track down a bug and trying to see what's going on. You can actually run S trace on any program um, and it will tell you all the system calls. So we have something like LS. We can run S trace on LS. And it's going to tell us every single system call that the LS process made. Uh, and you can see there's a lot. Why is there so much? Yeah. Yeah, there's, well, there's not only that, so there's retrieving uh, things about the directory. Um, let's do it again and do ls slash la, uh, let me slash temp. So that will run, and now we can look for slash temp. So we can actually see just the system calls that were related to slash temp. So it's stat, you can look up the man page for every single one of these system calls to understand exactly what's going on, but stat tells you information about that. It then tries to open slash temp. Um, it then calls fstat to get information about that, uh, which this get dense, uh, I think this gives all the directory information and then it's translating that and writing that out. But this is actually just the start of the program. There's actually all this other junk that has to happen. And this is because programs are complex and things need to happen. So this is the first exec, uh, exec VE LS. Then all of this stuff has to do, the loader has to load, it has to load in all the libraries that the LS process uses. This is all that stuff, but you can see literally everything that a single process does. Let's check. Okay, let's go back to challenge run. So how do we parse this? It says that we were expected to do an exec VE of the exec VE args uh, this past. So we can say, yep, that's good. Uh, and then we were supposed to uh, call exit zero. Okay, we didn't call exit zero. Why didn't we call exit zero? Louder? Yeah, I didn't write it. But my, let's look at the code, right? It's just a syscall. So what system call is being called? How can I figure that out? Yeah, I could debug it, I can see what's in the register, or I have this program here, I can run S trace. And it's telling me that it does an exec VE, and then it calls a read. So read zero, null zero. What was the, uh, somebody put it up, the x86 uh, system call table. 
I like the Chapman one. So it was the read, so we're calling read. So read means which value had to have been in RAX? Zero. And what was the file descriptor I passed in? Zero. Zero. And what was RSI? No. Null. And what was RDX? Also zero, right? So the seg fault is because we tried to read from null, I think. Although it's weird, why did it seg fault of it? Oh, probably because there was nothing after it, maybe. That's probably why. Uh, okay. So this is the wrong system call. Which system call do we want to call? What was it? Exit? We want to call exit, and we want to call exit zero. So let's go back in here. So if I want to call exit, I'm going to look for sys exit is 60. Thank you. Move into what register? RAX 60. And what do I want to exit on? What's the error code? Oops. So let's run it again. Uh, yeah, going back up to here. So it expects that I call exec VE, or sorry, exit, and then I pass it the argument zero, right? So you can think of this as essentially C code, right, of the arguments. So you can say, okay, the argument to exit must be zero. I can look in the syscall table and say this, uh, this, this uh, first table is RDI is the argument. So sys exit. So the error code goes in RDI. So I should be able to then say move into RDI zero. So move zero into RDI. Do the syscall. Run it. How can I check? How do I know before I run the challenge that I can check if I was successful? S trace. S -trace. How come I didn't get a seg fault here? Hmm? Why didn't you get a seg fault? Yeah. It was not because of that. Because I exited the program. The program literally stopped execution. Nothing else happened. What happened before when I wasn't calling exit um, was that what happens, so you call a syscall, and then the next instruction gets executed. So the problem was the next instruction after this was some garbage data that was attempted to be executed. Um, cool. OK, now we can see with this, we can see we have an exit 0 here, which is great. This is exactly what we wanted. Now, if we run this challenge run, hey, we get the flag. So we can see the exit zero and success. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, there's, this is essentially a check that it's executing correctly. So this isn't something, so we can actually run the S trace and see this. Um, I want to say, I believe this is an artifact of S trace that it does this and shows this system call because it's technically not happening from your program itself, right? Your program itself doesn't call an exec VE and exec VE is to execute another process. So this is just a check in here that this is happening correctly. Um, so this should always pass and you shouldn't worry about it. But this also means that it should be easy then to map what it expects to your trace of S trace. Okay. Now, if I were to go over to level two. So one shortcut is I can just pass in my last program into here. And we'll say, in this challenge, you'll create a socket. So expected output, the exec VE, a socket now, and then an exit. So we did the, oh, it doesn't know that the exit was correct. Interesting. We did an exec VE in the exit 
but we failed because we're missing this socket call. So how do we figure out how to make a socket call? Look on the syscall chart, figure out what system call is, is uh, socket, put that in RIX. Uh, what would be the next thing? Yeah, the parameters. This is where it gets slightly more tricky. Uh, because, so when you write it in C code, you can actually just pass in AF, INET, SOC stream, IP proto, IP. Why is that? Yeah, there's libraries and there's macros that are defined that define exactly what these things are. Um, and I cannot remember where they are on here, but let's just grab. There's several different ways we can do this. Uh, we can Google for AFINet uh, Linux. We can actually literally look at the system call. Yeah, there we go. Include Linux socket dot uh, H. So we can look at the source code of Linux, look at what it defines these values as. What did I say? AFINet. And this would be two. You do have to be slightly careful that you're looking at the right thing. BSD is another family of operating systems that implements a socket interface, right? The whole point of using macros like this is your, your C code doesn't, is not hard coding the value two, it's hard coding this macro. And depending on what systems you're using it and what header files you're pointing it to, it will work for your operating system. So these values may be different, let's say on a Mac versus a FreeBSD system versus a Linux system. I believe we should be able to find this on here. Uh, let's see. This is just to find it because I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, dash R. Oh, I want to, uh, sorry. Um, usually I'm supposed to talk about what I'm doing. Uh, I want to I want to output the file name that matches. I think it's, I can't remember if it's dash L. Yeah, uh, lowercase L, files with match. So I want to, ah. Oh, I did dash L. Oh, cool. Okay. All right, I'm getting a bunch of garbage, no such file, whatever, so I can redirect uh, standard error to dev null. Okay. And clearly my regular expression is busted. Um, oh, but there I think is. Well. Pearl. Do you know where it is? Yeah. How do I do a literal dot? All right, user lib, Python, user lib, Ruby, Python 3.8. Uh, there's a lot of junk. Hey, there we go, okay. Cool. So let's see if this matches up. Include Linux socket.h. I will. Okay, ah, so here we get uh, complicated, it's like this is defined as another one, so pfinet is defined as afinet, so pfinet is also two, yay, cool, so we got here in both ways. So you can, um, for a lot of these, you can look them up on your local file system using this file that we uh, just found together. Um, you can also do things like S trace is good because it will show you what that name is if it knows it. So when we call socket, 
if it knows the exact argument, it will give it to us in the text format so we can uh, double check. This is why you always want to, if you're super confident, I guess you can just run it with the challenge. Otherwise, run S trace, compare, make sure it looks the same as it should, and then you can run it against the challenge. Cool. Okay. But let's look at the other system calls that we need to make. So we did this, we did this. So we looked at open read and write system calls that allow us to interact with the file system. Now we're gonna look at system calls that let us talk to the network. Um, so one of the key concepts that's used when using network programming is the concept of a socket. Later on, we'll go into more in depth of what this means at the like TCP level. Uh, but for now, we can think of it, so when we call open on a file, what did we get back from the operating system? Yeah. Yeah, the file descriptor, right? And what was the file descriptor? Like if it told us it was file descriptor three, does that mean it was the third file on the system? Yep. Yeah, but describe well uh it's I wouldn't necessarily say it describes the file, although it kind of does. So it tells, it allows us to talk to the operating system about what file it is, right? So we ask the operating system, hey, open this file. And it says, okay, here's a file descriptor uh, and some integer. And when you want to read or write from that file, give me this file descriptor again, and I will let you read and write from that file. So the socket is a similar concept that we tell the operating system, hey, I'm going to want to do some network stuff. Here's the file descriptor that I want to use. Uh, or sorry, here's the, uh, we, let's go look at the, uh, let's see. Man three socket. Two? Two, yeah, it's two. Um, so we have the domain, the type, and the protocol. So this is, as we saw, it's a little bit, ah, here. We even have some examples here. So this is because there's different types of sockets that we can have. We may want to talk on all different types of protocols, and the operating system needs to know that. Uh, are we trying to talk on I internet, like IPv4 protocols? Is it IPv6? Is it, uh, I actually don't even know what half of these things are. Bluetooth, I guess we can talk Bluetooth on there. Uh, VMware, a VSOC thing, something to do with uh, VMware. All types of things. So this is the, the domain argument is one of these domains where we tell it, hey, this is the kind of communication I'm going to do. Then from there, we give it the type. Uh, and this is slightly more, defines how we interact with this socket. Um, we'll again go and we go more details down into the... Um, networking stack, but we can send uh, sockets, can be stream sockets where we can send as much data as we want, read as much data as we want. Um, whereas a datagram socket is like, a, you can think of it like a postcard. We just send some data, fixed amount of data to the other side. And um, we can do raw network access. Um, that's interesting, I wonder what that is for. Uh, anyway, so we can specify the type. We'll be using sock stream for almost everything that we do. Um, but we will, when we get into networking, we'll look at UDP and that will have datagram packets. Um, and then we have the type, uh, sorry, the protocol. So protocol is where? Protocol. Okay, the protocol specifies a particular protocol that should be used with a socket. Normally, only a single protocol exists to support a, partic a particular socket type within a given protocol family, in which case protocol can be specified as zero. However, it is possible that many protocols may exist, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, anyways, okay, so complicated, but 
Most of the time, we can ignore that, and it'll just be zero. And so when we do this, it's going to get us back and return the operating system if we set everything up correctly. We'll get everything going, get everything ready for us to then make the final, uh, to make other calls to this. But this doesn't actually do any connections or do anything. It just tells the operating system, hey, I'm going to do some networking stuff and I give me a final descriptor to talk about that. Cool. And that's when we get a bind uh, system call. So the idea here is we need to tell the operating system, uh, depending on what specific type we're using, but we, we want to assign an address to it. And we'll see what this looks like in a second. This is uh, actually a very kind of interesting thing. So this takes in a socket FD. Where did we get the socket FD from? From, yes, from the return value of calling socket. So we called socket, we got a return value. Then we're gonna bind that to an address. Let's look at the bind system call. We pass it a soc FD, which we already saw. Then we pass it this struct and an address length. So when a socket is created with socket, it exists. Oh, this is exactly what's on the slides. Um, traditionally, this operation is called assigning a name to a socket. Uh, it is normally necessary to assign a local address using bind before we can receive connections. Uh, the rules vary between families. Consult the entries in section seven for detailed information for AF INET, which is what we're going to be using. So if you want to like dig into this even more, uh, you can do seven IP, and I think seven is uh, like more not actual functions, but descriptions of things. Like this is the Linux IPv4 protocol implementation. Uh, so this tells you how to get a TCP socket or UDP socket. Anyways, um, this would tell you more about that, but we don't need to do that for our purposes. So the actual structure pass, this is what's kind of interesting. The actual structure pass depends on the address family. Different types of addresses have different sizes for things. So for instance, I think we briefly touched on this, but in you've seen IPv4 addresses? Yeah? What do they look like? Like 192.0.0.1. Yeah, like 192.0.0.1. So each of those dots, how many numbers can be within those? Nine. Zero to what? Yeah, zero to 255, so 256. So each of those is how many bytes? Four. Sorry, each, let's take it step by step. Each between the dot, right? So 192 dot blank dot blank dot blank. If each of those is 256 possible values. How many bytes is that? One byte. And there's four of them. So how many bytes in an IPv4 address? Four bytes, which is how many bits? 32. Look at this. Think about where you were like four weeks ago. Now you're just bits and bytes and powers of two like crazy. So IPv, uh, IPv4 addresses are 32 bits. So if you're... You, um, if you're trying to bind to a specific IP address, you would uh, give it something that's roughly uh, 256, I'm oh, sorry, uh, four bytes or 32 bits. But IPv6, well, what's the problem with IPv4 addresses? Anyone know? We'll run out of it. We've technically, I think, already run out, depending on how you count. There's no free like IPv6 address space for you to use. Uh, where are you getting your IP ad addresses from? They will usually have uh, extras that they can give you. And so when they created IPv6, don't ask me what happened to IPv5, I don't know. But when they created IPv6, they said, okay, we want enough IP addresses that we're never going to run out. So what did they do? So did they double it? Yeah, no, they quadrupled it. So. IPv6 addresses are 128 bits. 
or 16 bytes. So that's a lot. That's why they're, um, they actually use hex hexadecimal. Uh, uh, like this. Well, no, that's wrong. That's an Ethernet address. Does this not have an IPv4? This one? This one? It says it's link ether. Does that mean it's a MAC address though? I'm slightly worried. Three, four, five, six. Yeah, there should be eight octets if it's a, uh, right? Four, 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 four. 16, yeah, it should be 16, okay. There we go. Here's an IPv6 address. Oh yeah, that's right, because they use the two bytes and then they, if uh, things are zero between there, they have an empty colon, so this is just the format for IPv6 addresses. Anyways, it's not actually important. You don't need to know this, but it's cool to see this. So anyways, this is all getting the point across that like when you're talking about an operating system, depending on what type of socket you have, you may have different sizes of address, right? Um, And so that gets us to bind. Cool. So when we bind, uh, another fun fact about this is that um, you can, oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, is this actually causes, I found uh, on operating systems, this causes a lot of problems. Uh, having data structures where you have to specify, hey, there's this address and this is the length. Sometimes they'll get a structure and assume it's an IPv6 structure, like a big structure, but you passed it a small structure. And so it ends up reading memory outside of where it was assigned or the reverse, you say it's a, you, or another way you give it a small structure and it copies a big structure on there. And that's how you get an overwrite. So this causes like massive problems. Um, anyways. So we can dig further into this struct sock adder. Um, a sock adder, okay, so we gotta start digging in, um, parsing these C structures, because this is how we talk about these things. So this is a sock adder. You first have this SA family, and this tells it uh, what type of sock adder this is. Um, and it's, so it's the way to parse this is a uint, so an unsigned int. 16 is how many bits? So how many bytes is that? Four. Two. Two? Should start testing you more, huh? I messed up from two bits. It's okay. It happens. Uh, yeah, so eight, eight bits is a byte, so you int eight is the same as a character like you're used to thinking about one byte you in 16 two bytes so the first two bytes says the family and the rest of it uh, is how how to interpret this essay data so one key question is what's the total size of this struct sock adder in bytes so how many bytes for the essay family two. two and then how many for the rest 14 single bytes, so a total of 16 bytes. Yeah, cool. So sock adder underscore in, so the underscore in is not like incoming, it's for internet, like the abbreviation there. And so you still have the same family, 16 uh, bits, so two bytes for the family, and then a port, and then a 32-bit address. And this corresponds exactly with what we were talking about with how big are IPv4 addresses? Four bytes, which is how many bits? 32, which is exactly this SN adder. So socket internet address. Um, what are the ports for? When you were talking about and learning about the talking web, what port did you use? 80? Yeah, were there ways, why 80? That's a standard port that will 
Yeah, did you have to use AD? No, there was ways in the URL to specify different ports, right? Uh, so similarly here, when we're binding to an address, we're gonna bind to a port and an IP address. Uh, and specifically, when we're doing a server, we're gonna bind because that's what we're gonna listen on for incoming connections. So all the servers that you talk to on your browser, all of them had to literally call socket to get a file descriptor with the right arguments and then call bind and pass in a sock adder of what they wanted to pass in. Okay. <clears throat> so what we're gonna want this struct sock adder in to look like, oops, is we're gonna want the, the family, the first two bytes, to be AF INET because this is part of the specification. It's because we want anyone who looks at this to interpret this as an internet address. And then we have, so why can't we use 80 here? For the port, so we talked about port 80, why do we want port 80? This is the default for HTTP. Yeah, so it gets back into uh, endianness. Somebody remind us what endianness means? Just the way that it's our right, left or right. Yeah, so the, if the most significant byte is on the left or the right of a multi-byte uh, address in memory, and I kind of mentioned this, I think when we talked about endianness, that the CPUs use little endian order, but network protocols use big endian order. So this H, uh, H H tons or uh, host to networks uh, will flip the bytes around for us. And it also is a, well, there's a C wrapper that uh, will figure out if we are little Indian or big Indian. And if we're big Indian, it does nothing. If we're little Indian, it flips the bytes around correctly. Um, so we'll need to make sure that when we do 80, that it's actually the two bytes are in the right order. Then we need 32 bits that represent the IP address of 127.0.0.1. This is a special, actually it's technically a range of IP addresses, but this is a special IP address that means local host. And so that will be the sin adder. And then the padding, so we have eight bytes left over. So if you, what did we say it was? 16 bytes total for this uh, sock adder in, or sorry, for the uh, sock adder. And so this should be Two bytes for the family, two bytes for the port, uh, another four bytes, wait, or four, uh, four bytes for the address, eight, and then another eight is 16, which is exactly what the other one was, so the size of those structures are the same. Awesome. And then we can see this in memory of what this should look like. So this should be 16 bytes. The first two bytes should be 0200 because we saw AF INET is two. The next two bytes should be 80, I guess in hex is 50, but if it was normal 80, it would be 50, zero, zero. But because it's big Indian, those bytes are flipped around, zero, zero, five, zero. And then finally, these are the, uh, if you do the translation, oh, actually you can do this translation very easily, how? Yeah. Yeah, 127 is probably, uh, there's no Z's, but 7F is what you meant? Yeah. Uh, and each of those, right, we said is a byte. So you can easily convert each of those in the, they call it dotted decimal format, into a uh, hexadecimal value. Uh, we can just double check that because who likes leaving things unspecified? 127, convert it there, 7F, 0 converted to hexes, and 1 converted to hexes. Yeah, very easy. Thank you. Cool, so we have 7F001, and then we finally have these eight bytes of zero. So if we were like laying this out in memory, this is exactly how it looks like. And so if we pass this as the, uh, if we pass the memory address here as the argument to bind, it would then say, okay, 
you have a socket, I'm going to start listening on localhost 127.0.0.1, port 80. But why do you have to bind and listen? I don't remember. Oh yeah, that's saying that you want to actually start listing the things, right? Because bind says, okay, bind is address, it checks to see because you, um, you fundamentally can't have two different ports on uh, two, you can't be listening on two different ports of two different programs because whenever your operating system gets a packet destined for that port, it has to send it to some process. So it needs to know where it goes. Um, so we bind, thank you. Uh, we bind and then we start, uh, so then we've reserved that IP address and that port. And then we want to listen. This said that, okay, we are ready to start accepting incoming connections. And finally, uh, so we can look at what, so the SOC FD, we know that's the SOC, that's the file descriptor we got back from socket. Backlog, let's go check what the backlog is. Uh, the backlog de argument defines the maximum length to which the queue of pending connections may grow. If a connection request arrives when the queue is full, the client may receive an error. Uh, blah, blah, blah. If it's in, the request may be ignored so that a later attempt at connection receives. I guess I've never, I don't know what. Okay. Aha. Socket. Bound to a local address with bind. Listen and then accept. Okay, perfect. So if the backlog argument is greater than whatever is in this value, then it's silently truncated to that value. So great. So we can just put a very large value in there and then it doesn't matter. It will just use that and we can ignore it. Um, cool. Just large value in there. And then finally, this is everything to tell the operating system hey, this is. Uh, I want to listen to this type of communication. I want to listen on this specific IP address and port, and then I'm ready to listen. And then finally, we can um, call the accept system call where we give it a file descriptor and it then will return a new, okay, so it extracts the first connection request on the queue of pending connections. So I believe if we look it up, it'll say it's a blocking call. So this means that your program sleeps until a request comes in. Creates a new connected socket and returns a new file descriptor referring to that socket. So how many, after we get a connection, how many sockets do we have? Two, what's the first one? The listening one, yeah, the socket that we set up to tell the OS that we wanted to bind and listen. And then what's the second one? The return value of accept. So then accept is going to then return to us a new file descriptor that then we can, we'll use that as we'll see to read and write to that file descriptor and that gets sent to the other side of the connection. And when we read from that file descriptor, we are reading from the network connection. So this is how we can use this in order to listen to network uh, connections. Um, okay. So we can walk through this whole process and then where are we at? Oh, we still got a half hour. Ooh. Cool. So to accept a network request, we first call socket. So this is how we get an IPv4 socket that we care about. Uh, AFI net, SOC stream, IP proto IP. We call that the operating system finds in the file descriptor table of our process that, oh, file descriptor three is not being used. Great, I'm gonna set up this socket. 
We then bind, call bind, pass it in the file descriptor we got back, and pass it a pointer to that object that we just saw in memory, right? So this will then say, so what's the difference between the previous examples I showed and this example in terms of the uh, sock adder? Well, the address will def, uh, yes, which address? We need to be more specific. There's memory addresses, there's, yeah, the, the IP address. So 0000 is a very specific address. Uh, this, well, what would that be in bytes? So we know it's four bytes. What are those values going to be? Yeah, zero, right? 32, 32 bits, all zeros. Well, well that's why it was beeping. Oh, it wasn't your computer. I thought it was your computer. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, something was beeping, and I thought it came from this direction. I thought it was you. Uh, this is bizarre. Okay, just go on Twitch and you can see my screen. <laughs> I'm slightly kidding, but uh, we'll get it figured out. Success. Lighting increase. Presentation. Boom. Okay. Don't do that again. Bad system. Okay, so we're talking about the IP address. So. This is actually a way of restricting, uh, I believe it's access to what IP addresses can access your socket, so what you're listening on. So when you're listening on 0000, it means that anybody can make a connection to you. Whereas when you're listening from 127001, this means that only requests that come from you, from the local host, uh, will, be, will be sent on. This, Seems like a very, I don't know, trivial, very generic uh, description, but it turns out this has a lot of implications. So if you are, let's say, um, running a database on your local machine, like uh, because you're doing some web development stuff locally, and you're running a MySQL server, and you have a, you can run the database and you can tell it this exact argument, what IP address to use here. If you use 0000, it means that anyone on your local network could talk to your MySQL database. If you don't have authentication set up because, hey, it's your dev machine, you don't want to specify all that stuff, then anybody can connect to your uh, database. If you had customer data on there, anybody could access that. Similar things happen when you're developing uh, a web server or, uh, sorry, developing a web application locally. You can specify this host, like the, the IP address, and that will either allow other people to access it or restrict it. So this actually ends up being very important. Um, okay, well we can do this bind. So do we pass the right number of bytes as the third argument here to bind? Yeah, is it 16 bytes? That's what we said, we just counted the bytes, right? In each of those formats. We can then call listen. Oh, I guess we can just pass zero here and it will set it to the max value. Okay. Listen on the same file descriptor. Now we've told the operating system we are ready to listen. We then call accept. Oh, we didn't talk about the other arguments to accept, but let's look at those real quick. So this is a struct sock adder pointer and a sock length pointer, address length. So sock length is just like an int. So why is it a pointer that we're passing in? Yeah. But if we're just passing it in, then why would we pass in a pointer to an int? And not just pass the int in itself. So we don't modify it? Say it again? Or so we can't modify it? Correct. We want it to be modified, but we don't want to modify it. Who's going to modify it? The function itself. 
Yeah, the operating system, the function, whoever's calling this. So this is one way when you're looking at like a arguments to a function, this is how you reason about, even without looking at the documentation, what is this for, right? This is actually for the operating system to communicate back to us and to write out the values. Because if we just pass in an int, there's no way for it to write out. Remember we said that the return value returns the file descriptor. So what we'll see is what it's actually doing is it will give us a, an address of the IP address of the other side of the connection. This is how we can check what IP address that is, where that's coming from. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to know how big that is. So we need to pass in a pointer here. Anyways, this is just how to reason about this. I hope this will back me up. Otherwise, this was like a whole... Uh... The argument adder is a pointer to a sock adder structure. The structure is filled in with the address of the peer socket as known to the communication layer. So the peer being the other side of our communication. The exact format of the address returned is determined by the socket's address family, which we specified, and the respective protocol man page. When adder is null, nothing is filled in. In this case, adder length is not used and should also be null. The adder length argument is a value result argument. The caller must initialize it to contain the size. Ah, interesting. So we actually are passing in stuff there. The caller must initialize it to contain the size and bytes of the structure pointed to by address. This way the operating system knows how many bytes to write in and that it's not gonna write in more bytes than we gave it. Because if we have an address structure of only eight bytes, but it's trying to write 16 bytes in, it wants to know that. On return, it will contain the actual size of the peer address. So this is interesting. So we need, if we were using this, we need to know, okay, I need to actually specify a value here. I can't have it be a pointer to zero because then it won't write anything there. It needs to be a pointer to the actual size. Cool, okay. Oh, I guess, well, let's see the blocking. Uh, if no pending connections are present on the queue and the socket is not marked as non-blocking, except blocks the caller until a connection is present. This means the operating system will literally like freeze our program and just save it, wait until there's a connection. If the socket is marked non-blocking and no pending connections are present, then it fails with these specific error messages. So anyways, by digging into these documents, we could learn exactly if we wanted to build a, an operating system that, uh, or sorry, a, a network server that doesn't block on accept, it just checks every 10 seconds or something. We could do that with this. We'd have to figure out how to tell the OS that we want a non-blocking socket. I'm sure by digging into those other man pages, we could find this valuable information. Okay. But for our purposes, we can just call accept, pass in three, and set the values as null and null, meaning we don't care about the return values here. So when this returns, it will return uh, on the system call table, file descriptor four, the operating system will set up in our process, okay, four maps to this socket, which is now this peered connection. So this is the connection to the other side that we can then talk to. Okay. So, let's do this. Okay, before we dig in there, I want to talk about how we can actually pass in this sock adder struct. So we have this in C, and I don't want to do something that's too close to the level. So let's say, I'm going to run this. Okay, it wants me to call socket. I do really want to call socket though. Uh, we'll use a different type of socket, maybe. Okay. All right. Because what I want to show is calling bind. And I need a socket for that. So okay. Uh, somebody remind me what's the syntax here for comments? Is it semicolon or is it hash? Uh, hash. hash. Okay. Okay. So that's the exit zero. And now I want to call, let's say, bind 
uh, AF inet six, because this time I want an IPv6, because I'm not solving all these levels for you. There's only 11, so if I, I just did one, if I did another one, we're getting like up there and all the things that you'll be uh, having fun with. Um, oh no, I need to call socket, not bind, see? We're already at it. Okay, so I want to call socket on that. Let's see, socket uh, IPv6. Linux. Ah, cool. So I have another man page in here, IPv6. There you go. I want AFINet6, SockStream0. So this is the system call that I'm going to try to make. All right. So I'll need to put something into RIX. How do I know the something? Look it up. Look in the, you said it's 41? Should we trust you? Oh, there you go. All right, good, 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 good. Move 41 into RAX. Uh, move, so now I need this AF INET 6. So I'm gonna open up a new terminal. Uh, where did we say that was? Can I do half a level? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of doing it in here. It just depends on how you look. Um, there we go. Oh, I think that's the one I want, isn't it? Nope. Okay. It's in the bits. Include x86, 64. Then this actually makes sense if you think about it of like, why is there, so there's a user include Linux and then a user include x86, 64, Linux, GNU and this ARCH64, which if you looked at that, that would actually be ARM-based Linux of why those are different files because the exact layout of the bits and bytes varies between architectures or, or can, so that's why we need to be there. Anyways, INET6 is PF INET6. Which is 10, there we go. All right, so what was it? RDI, I think, was 10. So that should be, and the other thing I like to do as I'm doing this is document like what these values are, these random numbers that I'm just typing in here. Uh, so that when I look at it later, like you're doing a later challenge or you're modifying something, you actually know what this value is and not just like you just did it for this one time. Okay, and now I need the sock stream. Oh, no sock stream, okay. So I could, let's do another grep. There we go. And our bit socket type dot H. So sock, sock stream equals one. Let's go look at this file just to see what else is in there because we are curious people. Oh, uh, here we have different ones. Sock stream, dgram, raw, RDM, sequence packet. Cool. So this was, oh, I actually can't remember what the another parameter is. So this was the protocol. So RDI, RSI, RDX, move into RDX2. Was that correct or did I just make that up? It is one. So it's RSI? RDI, RSI? RDI, RSI, there you go, thank you. Move into, you said it was RDX, zero. Should I add a comment that this is zero? No, it's useless, don't do that. Okay, so if this is correct, 
I should run this with S trace and see this exact socket call. Socket with AF inet six, sock stream zero. Oh, actually, shoot, I wanted to run it with S trace. I thought I did. No syscall, thank you. None of you saw that when I was typing this up? So it's great when you're in front of you because then you can just always say it was a, a, a teaching moment. Okay, calling socket, AFI net six, sock stream. What's this IP proto IP? It probably is zero. Like, we don't know, we didn't look it up. I'm sure we could look it up, and that just happens to be zero. We passed zero in for there. Uh, it said we can just do zero, so it's asking us for zero, it's totally fine. Uh, if we did really want to double check, we could double check that, but I'm very confident. Uh, how do we know that this socket call was correct? What's non-zero? The equals three, this specifically means the return value of this system call was three. Uh, if we looked in the man page, we would see that any negative value indicates a, an error. So where in my assembly code, where can I get this return value? RAX, yeah, just like that's what we talked about with system calls. That's where the return values are. Okay, cool. So now I have to re-remember what was the whole point of this diversion. Uh, it was to call bind, right? You don't know, you're just here. Okay, because I wanna call bind, now I'm in a little bit of a weird place because I'm not doing the same thing. I'm using an IPv6, so my struct I think it's be a struct sock adder in six. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Sick. Okay. So this is what we're going to need to do. So this is a family and then a port number. So the port number should be the same size. I think this still should be a 16. Uh, bits, so two bytes. Uh, and then a flow info. I actually don't remember what this is. And then a struct in adder, in six adder, which is 16 characters. How many bytes is a character? One. And so it's an IPv6 address is how many bytes? Sixteen, which is what we talked about earlier, right? So it went from four bytes for IPv4 to sixteen bytes for IPv6. Uh, okay, so let's look here a little bit. Sin six family is set to AF inet six. Port is the protocol port. Uh, C sin port in IPv6, so it's the same. It's going to be two bytes. Sin six flow info is the IPv6 flow identifier. Let's just put that as zero. I actually don't know what that is, but we'll just put it as zero for now. Sin six adder is the IP is the 128 bit IPv6 address. Sin six scope ID is an ID depending on the scope of the address. Let's also set that to be zero. Uh, it is new in Linux 2.4. Thank you. Uh, supports it only for link local addresses, in which case it contains an interface index. All right. Cool. The port space is shared with IPv4 and v6. That's great. Okay, so we can work with this. So that's what we're trying to do. So we're going to bind to, let's go back to the slide. We're going to call bind. Where's our good friend bind? There we go. We're going to be bind on, oops, whoa, hello. I don't use Vim, so I have no idea what that was. Okay, let's say something like this, FD equals socket. And so that I can reuse that in my comments, bind FD. 
I need a pointer to this adder. So uh, let's call it IPv6. The address of IPv6 uh, sock adder. And let's go back and figure out the size. Uh, not that. So the family is two bytes, the port's two bytes, the flow info is 32, which is four, so two, two, four, four, eight. Uh, another four, what's that, 12 plus 16 is 28. So probably 28 bytes. We'll see if that's wrong or right, but I think that's correct. Okay, now, so first things first, Need to figure out the bind. What's the bind syscall number? 49, thank you. I already messed up. Why, how did I mess up? Yeah, because right here, after this syscall, the FD is in RAX. But the very first thing I did here was overwrite RAX, and now I will never get back that syscall number. So, yeah, let's do that uh, here. Let's use, uh, I don't know, into RBX, let's say. RAX, so now we're storing that into RBX. Now I can safely remove it. And now if, uh, so let's come back to this RDI and just say big socket thing. And now we want to move our SI, the third argument, we're gonna move 28 into there. Wait, that's wrong, okay. This should be RSI, this should be RDX. That's the address there. And into RDI, which, what do I want to be in the first argument? RBX, so FD. This will be the address of IPv6 sock adder. And what do I got to end with? Which I messed up last time, but now I remembered. Syscall. Okay, should this work? Uh, so somebody online is on Twitch is asking if there's any other source we can find the value that goes in ifnet. Uh, the answer is no, you have to use the header files. Uh, there may actually exist a something out there. Well, let's go, let's move zero into here because this is definitely, this should not work. Okay. Compile it, it compiles. It's kind of shocking. Okay. So what does this at least tell us? Yeah, we called bind correctly. We correctly passed in the file descriptor. We did correctly pass in null. We said zero today there. We set in 28. But what is the return value? Did, did bind execute correctly? No, because it returned a negative one. And if we wanted to check that, we could check that in our code in EAX. But we want it to point to that giant structure. So how do we get this giant structure into our program? What are some options? What was that? The stack. We could use the stack and put the bytes onto the stack and lay them out correctly. What else? Yeah, we could use our program's memory, right? We could actually have a data section that we can put, uh, think of it as global memory, right? Global memory to our program. Uh, so the stack is also useful to our program, but we actually know exactly what values we want to put in there. Um, although I guess we didn't talk about what kind of IPv6 sock adder we want to do. So let's do that right now. Linger, a linger structure, that's interesting. 
Why was that needed? Okay. All right. Yeah, so we did it like this. So let's look at All right. I'm going to use another uh, goal. Okay. So what I want is, so to go with that last thing, so I'm looking for a sock adder in six that has the AF INET 6 as the family, so the first two bytes, and then the port, uh, uh, let's do, somebody give me another port number. 81. 81, no. <laughs> Some, 80, 80, okay, perfect, I like that. No, I also don't like that, because then, oh, uh, yeah, that'll work, okay. I was worried if the host to network would be weird, but, um, okay, great. So flow info zero, then we need our unsigned. So this is our IPv6 address. So we need 128 bits. Uh, let's do something like this. 00112233445666. Zero, zero, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, seven, seven, eight, eight. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Do I need another one? These addresses are way too large. Ah, there we go. That makes more sense. I actually think it's more like this, but whatever. All right, we'll do it like that so we can easily translate this into bytes. These are hex values. So I'm just using this as shorthand to say, I want the numbers to be from 0, 0 to FF, 0, 0, 1, 1 as the, the digits. All right, so that's the address, and now I need a scope ID. So my scope ID is going to be zero, and then finally that should be it. Okay, cool. So that's our goal. Put them side by side. Okay. So we can use that data. So if we were to lay this out in memory, we'd first want. So the first was how many bytes? Two bytes. So our goal is what? Two bytes. Uh, it should be what? AF INET 6, which we had here, which is 10. So it should be 10. Two bytes, 10. OK. And if we, I actually can't remember the assembler syntax. A6. Uh, directive. So the same uh, document, yeah, there we go. The same document that has all the directives of the rept n and stuff like that should have, yeah, so data, great. There's a way to tell the assembler exactly which ones we want. Oh no, we're almost done. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Uh, short is the same. Okay, great. Uh, let's use dot short. Cool. Okay. So we can use dot short 10. So this means I want as a short, so a short is two bytes. I have that, and then I have the dot short. The next short is going to be the bytes. So this should be, uh, let's see. So 8080 in hex is 1F90. What do I have to be careful about here? Little, Little endian, so I'm gonna flip them around. Uh, the next one is 32 bits, so that's uh, 
Yeah, D word, I think. Oh, maybe L word? How many words? Oh man, this word thing is horrible. Okay. You're trying to get four bytes? Yeah. You can do a dot four bytes. What? Like dot number four bytes. Mm, if it's not in the docs, I'm not going to show it. <laughs> okay. Val. Dot space. Oh, okay. Emits size bytes each of value fill. Okay, that's kind of cool. Okay. Dot space. This probably is not the best way to do this, but uh, zero. So four bytes of zero was this. We'll do this one next, but let's just call it uh, 12 FF. And dot space four zeros. And I need to give this a label. Call it big one. And I think I should be able to just move. Not like that. Oh my god, that compiled? Oh, so close. OK. All right, I'll, I don't know, I guess I'll figure out, maybe we'll, uh, I don't want to do this on Wednesday. Is it because I didn't do the address of it correctly? Yeah. Oh, it's offset, if you want. Is that a label? Yeah. It's offset. Offset and all caps. If you want to do a movement set up in LA. Uh, this is why I hate them. What is going on? Oh, there we go. Oh, just when you were leaving, you thought it couldn't be done. Right at the buzzer. SA family, AFI net six, port, hosts a network short, AD80, whatever this thing is. No, I, I did do all negative ones because I didn't want to do the actual stuff, but yeah, sick. All right, we're done.